I actually like this a bit better. Um, when you compare uh, these texts in Hebrews, the ones that the critics typically mention about to the, going to the right hand of the Father at his throne, what we're finding in Revelations between four and five, check this out, Brendan, check this out. When you, This is awesome. Look at this parallel between the text that the critics are using. I like to use the text they're using so we can answer them directly. They're saying, oh, this says he went to the right hand of the Father to the throne, so he bypassed because they say that there's no throne in the holy place. In Revelation chapter four and five, we have a scene, a view of the holy place in heaven. How do we know? Mm -hmm. Because it mentions the candlesticks. Mm -hmm. It mentions the incense. Now, let me ask you a question. If you walk into a room and you see a sink, a toilet, and a bathtub, what kind of room are you in? It's a living room, obviously, right? <laughs> <laughs> in a very small apartment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would hope that nobody nobody has a toilet in the living room. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, but not really. What we're walking into is a bathroom, right? Yeah. Well, when you walk into this room, you know, of course, by reading it here in Revelation chapters four and five, and you see the table of, uh, you see the incense, and then you see the seven branch candlesticks. What room is that? Well, according to the type, that's the holy place. And what's interesting is that in that in that room that we're seeing. There's a throne because it says in verse chapter four, verse one, that the father seated there on his throne. It says that the lamb slain comes to him to his right side or to the right hand. Right. It talks about the majesty on high, just like those texts in the book of Hebrews. So you see all these parallels. Right. What we're seeing is that he actually went to the holy place and did the work in the holy place. Right? After dedicating everything, he then began to work in the holy place as a faithful and a faithful fulfillment of the earthly type. Yeah. Right. What do you guys think? Anybody want to share some thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add a, a quick verse. That was amazing what the two of you said. And, you know, this verse is not, it's not going to be as impactful, but, you know, to me, it, it just is because you hear a lot of critics saying things like, you know, um, the, the Shekinah glory was in the most holy place, which it was. So if Jesus went into the sanctuary um, in 33 AD and he was in the presence of God, that must mean that Jesus was in the most holy place because that's where the Shekinah glory was. But pay attention to this verse right here in Isaiah chapter 6 and uh, verse 1. So in Isaiah... So in Isaiah 6, verse 1, Isaiah gets a vision of God um, sitting on the throne in the sanctuary. And he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe and his train filled the temple. So, yes, God's Shekinah glory was in the most holy place. But it's an incorrect assertion to say that that's only where the presence of God was. Mm. No, the presence of God was everywhere in the sanctuary. Because right. scripture says right here that the train of his robe filled the sanctuary. The moment that you walked in, whether you were in the inner court, the holy place, or the most holy place, you were always in the presence of God. Exactly. So that means that when Jesus ascended to the heavenly sanctuary, him being in the presence of God doesn't necessarily mean that he was in the most holy place. That is a great text. That is a great text to always keep in mind. And I've often wondered if, what are we limiting um, the presence of God to just one part of the heavenly sanctuary? Um, when in my understanding, his presence fills um, heaven itself. And so, especially when we look at a text like this, we have him filled up the whole temple. So good text, brother. Randy, I know I saw your hand, brother. Go ahead and share. I mean, um, I mean, I, that's a good text, Deontay. But in addition to that, um, actually, if you go to verse six, right? Um, same, same book, verse six. Same book. Yeah, same check, same book. All right? It says, then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live mm -hmm. coal. And again, I wonder where he got the tongue from. Where he got the coal from? Because if we understand from that, if, if we are in the presence of God, right? We said, well, sitting upon a throne. Where, I wonder where he got that that from. Um, <laughs> last time I checked, the most holy place is actually um, the, the, department that, uh, the apartment that actually contains the, the Ark of the Covenant. All right? Mm -hmm. um, there's no, there's no, there's, there's no one that I know of. That has a has a coal or a tongue or a sense or anything that type of thing that would make some sort of purge. So um, I don't think that's most holy place language, right? Mm -hmm. Which and if we understand that the first verse talks about you know seeing Christ or seeing God as far as the Lord sitting upon a throne. So 
I, I think, you know, there's reason to believe that we shouldn't only limit God's presence to the most holy place. Also, um, I think the question originally was talking about uh, that after the ministry of Christ, he went straight to the most holy place. Right? I think sometimes that kind of helps us to overlook what happened in the actual uh, typical uh, sanctuary service. If you go to Leviticus chapter four, and I believe it's verse 16, 17 around there, um, if you got, if you can pull that up real quick. So, um, I can, well, and yeah, and you can actually do verse 17, but you know, 16, 17 is fine. So then the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation. That's verse 16. Verse 17, it says, and the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. Right. So, um, before the veil, not after the veil, right? Mm -hmm. And so we understood the veil was was the veil that um, that separated the holy place from the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. And so notice after the after the animal was slain, a portion of the blood was taken to sprinkle on the veil that actually separated the holy place and the most holy place. That's a holy that's a holy place ministry, right? This right. is what this is what happened next. So I'm, I'm not, Pastor, go before, ahead. Before, yeah, yeah. yeah. Before, before the actual most holy, exactly, which means you're in the holy place. If I can make one one tiny distinction, and this is one that that has caused a, a lot of grief for people, that sure. is the assumption that the blood is sprinkled on the, the the veil, which would require cleaning up the veil and so on. And I I, I dug into that and tried to find any an, instance where it actually said that it was on the veil. It's always before the veil, before. which means down before. on the ground before. Yep. Now, um, Brother Edwin, if you could bring back up your uh, slide that you had that had uh, uh, the description about the the presence might be the one before this one, the the bread of the presence. Can you find that? This one right here. Okay. Yes, there you go. Hebrew lachem panim lech, lechem. Uh, that's where Bethlehem comes from. Lechem. Um, so that's bread, and panim is presence. So mm -hmm. it's it's like. I don't know if you if, if if your little kids have ever done this to you, but um, when a little child wants to get your your attention, uh, sometimes they'll walk right up front to you and put their hands on your face, you know, like this, "Daddy, look at me," you know, like that. They, and because this is the meaning of panim, your face right in front of you, so mm. bread that's right in front of the presence of God. So again, we have another re-emphasis that God's presence is specifically described as being in that, that compartment.